everyone. We are here today. I am here with the lovely and wonderful Lindsay Hookway, who all of you probably know from Feed Sleep Bond. She has done, I mean, I just want to get, I laughed when I saw, we're going to talk about a paper today. We're not talking about sleep, contrary to, I think, what everyone would expect. I know, right? But I looked at your paper. So Lindsay has a paper called Breastfeeding the Critically Unwell Child, A Call to Action. And I laughed because there's your name. And then there's like 8 million things after it, because apparently you have more credentials than anyone I've ever met in my life. Um, so if you don't know, Lindsay is a registered nurse, international board certified lactation consultant, speaker, author, two books out this year in one year alone, which is just insane. Researcher, because you're doing your PhD right now too, correct? This is the research here. Um, founder of the Holistic Sleep Coaching, uh, program that you run. You work with clients, you speak, you teach, you, I mean, what don't you do out of just curiosity here? Like, Well, I, I don't, I don't really do work-life balance. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm Shocker. not surprised by that based on what I've just, but it was, yeah, so it was quite the shock, but there we go. But I was, I am so excited to talk about this because this is something, um, We'll get to the whole story, but I love research. I love sharing research and I love talking about research. So the fact that I can talk about this with the person doing the research is even more exciting. And the fact that it's something that is so left out of mainstream mainstream discussions is just, it's crazy. So um, let's get into it. So why don't you start please by telling everyone a bit about the paper and how you came to get to this topic in your research. Okay, so um, it's great to be here, by the way. Thank you for thank you for inviting me. And also thank you for um, wanting to chat about something that's not sleep, because I do <laughs> seem to spend most of my life talking about sleep and sleeplessness. Yes. But actually, this is this is a really, really um, important topic. It's something that's really, really close to my heart. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a pediatric nurse, first and foremost, I've, I've I've been nursing children for uh, almost 20 years. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I love the intersection of my work between sick kids and supporting breastfeeding. But a lot of the research that we have around um, childhood illness and breastfeeding is all about prevention. And that's really important. That is such an important piece of the public health message um, talking about, um, you know, the, the you know, we, we try and steer away from saying that breastfeeding has benefits and breastfeeding prevents illness and disease and all of that, because, you know, as tricky and triggering as this is for a lot of people, and I am so mindful of that, breastfeeding is the biological norm. And therefore, the real truth is that actually deviating from the biological norm can increase the risk. But I think sometimes, one of the things that can be slightly, I don't know, maybe forgotten about or maybe, um, you know, maybe it's just a secondary issue is that just because breast and chest fed children have a lower incidence of lots of, you know, diseases doesn't mean that they don't ever get sick. And what we know far less about is actually what is it, what is it actually like to try and breast or chest feed a little one who is really sick, who's got arterial lines and splints and brain shunts. And, um, you know, they're having goodness knows how many um, transfusions and infusions and um, drains, all of that stuff. How do you how do you persevere with the breast or chest feeding relationship when you're looking after a really medically complex kiddie? Um, and that's that's kind of where my interests have been channeling for a, a long time, um, mainly because, um, you know, when I was working as a pediatric nurse, I, I, I just saw that actually when anything was ever so slightly difficult or tricky, people would just be like, well, you know, sometimes we've just got to let breastfeeding go. You know, it, it's we've just got to focus on making this kid better. You know, they've got sepsis. They've got. I don't know, they've got something horrible wrong with them. 
let's not get bent out of shape about whether they're having breast milk or formula milk or donor milk or whatever, because actually that's not the most important thing. But it's so misguided because not only is it really important for those kiddies, because hopefully they will come out of whatever this acute um, phase is, and therefore they do still have the protection in terms of public health of some of those long-term protective factors. So there's that piece, but also there's the fact that it's not just about the milk anyway. If it was, you know, we could we could just go, oh, well, never mind. Let's just pump the milk and give it to them any which way we can. It doesn't really matter. But we know that it's not just about the milk. We know that it's about the relationship. And then the final part of that is that, well, actually, what difference is it making to the family? And actually, it's really important for um, parents and families to uh, maintain that really important parenting role um, that is bringing comfort to their child, never mind all the immunological factors that we have to think about. It's so I could talk about this all day. I, I won't. Know. But, uh, well, I hope we can, because it's, you know, you saying that I have been very lucky that I have not had an acutely ill child yet. And I hope I don't. But having nursed them, like I'm still nursing my five-year-old. And I feel like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong if you saw this, but it feels like as a parent who who nurses, it feels like it would give me some sense that I could do something for my yeah. child. Like the feeling of helplessness, I imagine I would feel would be overwhelming. And nursing feels like it just hands this little piece to families when they are choosing to breast or chest feed here's this little piece that you can have some control. You can offer your child something comforting, loving, you know, warm, that would be incredibly valuable at that stage. Is that, I mean, do parents report that being part of it at all when you speak Absolutely. to them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, the, the stories that I hear um, from, from people, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to, um, I, I admin a group called Breastfeeding the Brave, um, and the stories that they tell me um, about the meaning of breast and chest feeding or nursing their little ones, when it's the only real positive thing they can do. You know, the kiddies with cancer who are so nauseous, and actually the only thing they can tolerate is human milk. Um, and they don't want it down the tube. It's not It's not about the milk, It's. it's about the act of, nursing that's that's the big deal yeah. or you know there was a there was another um parent in the group who um was told to wean her child abruptly due to um a, a very very complicated airway story that is still evolving but the the she was not counseled very well unfortunately and the upshot was that she was told she had to just stop and the words that she um that she told me were just unbelievably poignant. She said that she's lost one of the most important parts of being able to comfort her child. And he's got more surgery to come, only next time she won't be able to comfort him by nursing. Um, and it's, it's just heartbreaking for these families that who want to be able to continue yeah. breast or chest feeding it's not about making them breast or chest feed you, i mean anyone who um who who knows me knows that i'm not into saying right well you just got a breastfeed you know you just got to get on with it that's not what it's about these, these are families who want to breast or chest feed and they're being prevented or they're being um, sort of stymied or there the, the are obstacles that shouldn't be there and all of that stuff um, that's what grinds my gears because um, these parents desperately want to be able to there was and one parent who said it made me feel like I was part of the solution instead of part of the problem like... and that's what you want parents to feel they need to feel involved in that way because although the patient is the child the child doesn't exist on their own without their family and their parents there. So we have to kind of look at that dyadic element or triadic with other parents and larger with siblings and all of it that go there. But yeah. I mean, it is, it's a crucial piece there. So, I mean, this whole article, what I love is this call to action is it really is a very concrete, like this is 
this is what we need to get done, people. Can we please just look at these are the challenges and in each one you highlight what needs to get done. But one of the things I wanted to touch on and try to understand is, as you point out, the NICU, we've got the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, we've got things going. So the NICU seems to be really working with families in a better way. But it's this getting out to the pediatric unit, which is separate. So why is there, why have we not seen this translation happen? I mean, presumably you're looking at, you know, similar, same hospital even, how what's what's gone wrong in pediatrics here like can you just solve the problem for us and let us know everything that has come wrong? <laughs> let me just summarize you know uh 30 years you. of um a gap okay so i mean i think it's important to say that i'm not the only person who knows that this is a problem i'm certainly not some kind of you know unique um entity there are lots of very 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 wonderful people within the pediatric sphere all recognizing that actually we need to do better for our um, for our breastfed little ones, and that's not just babies; that's you know nursing toddlers and preschoolers and older kiddies as well. So that's the first thing. Um, you're absolutely right. The Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, and in the UK we have something slightly different, which is just the Baby Friendly Initiative UK. Um, both of them uh, they initially started in the um, sort of the, the maternity department, so it started off as you might expect at, you know, where breastfeeding begins, and that's at birth. Um, So very, very sensibly and rightly, that's where it originated. So Mm -hmm. let's get babies in skin to skin, let's get feeding happening early, let's get support in early, let's teach people how to hand express their milk and maintain milk supply if it's not going brilliantly. And then of course, there's quite a natural transition into the neonatal intensive care unit because of course neonatal intensive care unit is also from birth so it makes sense that if we've got an initiative in maternity and obstetrics that we also have something going on in the NICU as well although it did take quite a lot of years um, more to get it moved into the NICU and then we've also got it in the community because people again rightly figured that you know actually babies hopefully don't spend a lot of time in hospital we have to get them home we have to have them in the community and therefore let's look at the community team so in the UK we have um, specialist public health nurses or health visitors uh, and and we have whole community teams that are now accredited and then amazingly it started moving into universities as well so we have um, you know health visiting schools and colleges and we have um, midwifery um, schools and colleges who are also baby friendly accredited but the gap is paediatrics. And here's where the problem is, because if your child is, um, if, if they are completely healthy, hopefully, if they're born in a baby friendly accredited hospital unit, whatever, they will have great care to initiate established breastfeeding or find another way of making it work if there's a, you know, an initial problem with it. Then they go home. They also hopefully have good care if we're lucky, if we've got a baby friendly accredited unit or even if that baby is diagnosed with, um, I don't know, congenital diaphragmatic hernia and they are um, born in a tertiary referral unit so that they can go straight to a level three NICU. Hopefully, again, if the NICU is baby friendly accredited, they will still get great care. But what about the babies who are born healthy and then they uh, they get I don't know let's let's think about something really common so let's talk about respiratory syncytial virus which bronchiolitis is the common name that hits pretty much between about November and March um, in the northern hemisphere every year so if your baby is born healthy but then they start struggling to breathe and they get bronchiolitis in December Um, and they are moved into hospital, they will go to the paediatric ward. As soon as you've left the hospital, no matter how many days old your baby is, they're going to go to paediatrics. They're not going to go back to the maternity unit and they're not going to go to NICU. So if you've got a three day old baby who's been home and they develop horrible jaundice, for example, they're not particularly unwell, but they're just not feeding very well and they're not they're very sleepy and they might need some phototherapy Um, they are going to be admitted to pediatrics so if they've ever been home and they they become unwell into pediatrics they go and 
this is the department that is not set up for um, you know breastfeeding support normalization hacks you know workarounds and so parents often describe that actually it was great in the postnatal unit it was fine at home the midwives came and supported them at home they got onto pediatrics poof it all just went completely out the window um they were told to give you know 68 mils of something um nobody really cares what is often the impression that parents get we don't really care what milk your baby's getting they need to have their 68 mils every three hours um and it's going to go you know we, we we need to know how much they're getting so it's going to go in a bottle or it's going to get down the tube or whatever and that's often where breastfeeding goes to die um because who can who can compete with that right who yeah. can who can um maintain milk production when they are stressed out of their brain um they've had to you know leave everything um especially if it's in the very early days after having given birth you know you saw you're bleeding you've got other kids at home potentially um all of that is happening and then suddenly you go back into the hospital and you know it feels like it's very disjointed because the care that perhaps existed in postnates or the community or midwifery is not replicated in pediatrics you know, it's a big problem. It's funny. I said, I've been lucky. I never had this, but when you bring up bronchiolitis, it's like, yes, actually we did have a hospital visit, but it was just a day. We were very lucky when my son was one month old. And it's true. I thought about when they had him hooked up to measure oxygen levels, everything, like we'd gone to our doctor thinking it was going to be fine. And she's like, I'm referring you to the ER right now. So go straight there. We're like, oh my God. But even just trying to nurse him at that point when he was hooked up to everything and he's lying on the bed and I'm like trying to get on in weird positions. And it's like, even just the room was not set up to be, I couldn't lie down with him. Like I, I did my best to, but it was quite, I didn't think about it in the long term. We were lucky we were there for like 12 hours and then they sent us home, um, which was another frustrating because they're like monitor him overnight because chances are he'll get worse. So we're sending you home because we're so booked, but you know, just watch him overnight. I'm like, I'm exhausted. I've been here for, it's like midnight. I luckily have a friend with my daughter. I'm like, what? Now I've got to stay up and watch him all night. And they're like, you'll probably be back tomorrow. So, and I'm like, but just stay where you have the little clip and then it beeps if it goes low. Like, <laughs> You know, it's just like, it's winter, check for this. I'm like, but he's wearing PJs that are warm because it's cold. But from the breastfeeding perspective, it was really, I made it work. I was in, I was moving around, but it was not easy to get him. It was not set up in a way that was very friendly. And it's true. No one, I don't think anyone even asked if they, luckily we didn't hit the feeding or anything. So as long as he was feeding, they were fine, but it was it was not conducive to, to that. Um, it was certainly, it was so focused on his little bed and stuff and not anything I could get into that it was, I can see how difficult that would be. And if you're there for any extended period of time, um, that is another issue altogether. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it really is. And, but, but actually when I, um, so I, I, um, my systematic review will be out early next year and, and, uh, crikey I looked at 800 papers that um <laughs> you know what it's like um, know. Yeah, you know let's let's see what literature is out there that is mm -hmm. talking about um breast or chest feeding very very sick or even just moderately sick kids um, mm -hmm. as long as it's not about NICU as long as it's about pediatrics I was interested so I screened 800 papers I chucked most of them out because most of them were related to the NICU um, yeah. on you know closer inspection so I was left with 11 papers um, at the end of that so that is the, the the world pool of literature on nursing sick children um, breastfeeding sick yeah. children at the moment um, so I'm working on that but the, yeah. the upshot is that most of the research is either it either relates to very very specific scenarios so the, the ones that the literature is focused on are things like Down syndrome, um, heart defect, cardiac defect, um, and things like phenylketonuria, which is a metabolic um, disorder in, you know, it's congenital metabolic condition. 
so, so and that's pretty much it oh and cleft palate cleft lip and palate was the other thing that people have looked at so they're they're very structural specific things so cleft lip and palate it's pretty obvious why people would have examined the impact of feeding with cleft lip and palate because clearly if you've got a a non-intact palate um mostly but also to a lesser extent a, a non-intact lip it makes breastfeeding more physically difficult so that's i can understand that i can understand um the focus on down syndrome because these babies um they often have low tone they can be more difficult to to hold and stabilize and also they do sometimes have other um, issues like cardiac defects and, and things like that um, so that's understandable and then the cardiac um, little ones um, these little heart babies as they're known um, they do have a sort of a, a very specific cluster of problems um, that relate very very specifically to feeding and also these little ones do get very tired they often have higher caloric need and so I suppose it's filtered into lactation support because a lot of lactation consultants know that actually these little ones um, they need support to, to um, feed as efficiently as possible and um, we sometimes need to induce an oversupply because these little ones sometimes need more than a normal healthy milk supply. Mm -hmm. But that's it. And there was one paper in the world that looked at acute illness. Um, and that was a, a paper that's a couple of years old. Um, and it basically found that actually it wasn't the severity of illness that really impacts um, whether breastfeeding goes OK or not, which is actually not very surprising to me. It wasn't the, the severity. So it wasn't the children who were ventilated and in intensive care. It was actually related to just the systems and structures and breastfeeding could actually be sabotaged in a short two or three day admission. Um, and, and so for me, the important thing about that is actually it's not just about, well, let's move what we know about, you know, NICU and supporting breastfeeding in the NICU into PICU. Let's think about, well, how can we get more breast pumps and how can we have more storage facilities for express breast milk. That's not it. Actually, yeah. that's that's an easier part of the puzzle. The, the more tricky part is how do we develop a culture of actually valuing breastfeeding as part of routine pediatric care um, on the ward. So for a child with a fairly common or garden admission, like exacerbation of asthma like bronchiolitis like jaundice um like rotavirus or norovirus or covid or whatever it whatever it is um i said the c word didn't i um, <laughs> whatever it is how can we have a culture where actually people go how is this little one fed it matters how this little one is normally fed let's be respectful to that how can we continue to make this work even though this child has an acute illness or a chronic illness or whatever it is, how can we still value the role that breast and chest feeding is having whilst also making this little one better? And that's the part that's not necessarily happening consistently. And there are some little pockets of excellence that I'm aware of, and it's so wonderful, but it's not consistent. Do you think that having greater um training in lactation for doctors that are and nurses that are on the ward is an answer or is it i know you mentioned in the piece you talk about um bringing in lactation consultants to a medical team to kind of help with this that you have this other voice but clearly that's needed um but i feel like there's also this piece missing where breastfeeding is still even in the medical literature like you found it is about the immunological components the it, it's broken down it's not about the experience it's not about the psychological well-being of you know i think about a child that's ill and um the role of predictability in how we feel comfortable and being yeah. able to know that that is that remains for the child that level is there but where does that training come in is it at the hospital level later? Is it earlier? Like where, where do we put this in? Like it. <sighs> so um, at the moment, I'm um, I'm doing a, a national survey um, of 
healthcare professionals just working in paediatrics. So that survey went out at the beginning of the month and I'm gathering data until I think probably February. I'm trying to capture RSV season. Um, so that was that was, get it through ethics quick so we could get the survey out ready for RSV ethics. season. Oh God, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, um, it happened. So so the survey is out and um, you know, I'm not I'm not like officially analyzing it yet at the moment. But one of the questions I'm asking of all of these healthcare professionals, and mostly it's nurses who are asking me, but I'm getting a lot of pediatricians um, uh, answering the survey as well, as well as allied health professionals. So physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, dietitians, you know, all of all of those wonderful people as well. And what they're all saying is no, we hardly had any training in breastfeeding as part of our undergraduate training. And yes, we absolutely think that this would be helpful. No, I don't really feel that skilled in a lot of areas to do with um, with uh, breastfeeding support and, and maintenance of lactation in the absence of um, efficient, effective breastfeeding. Um, and you know you know that they're all saying that they think it would be really really helpful to have um specific breastfeeding training and not just um not just basic breastfeeding training but actually that's specific to caring for sick kids so actually how is it different yes of course we need to talk about all of the normal stuff and all of the physiology of lactation and all of that of course that's a given but mm -hmm. we also really need additional tools like how do you get a baby who's been NG tube fed back to the breast again. Yeah. How do you support a baby with low tone to be able to effectively feed? How do you support a baby with a really floppy airway to be able to feed so that they have a safe swallow? How, you know, all of that stuff that happens all the time in pediatrics, people mm -hmm. need those skills. And I suppose my, my vision ultimately, um, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would want a, a specific designated pediatric infant feeding team. That's what I want. I want a pediatric infant feeding team that's headed up by somebody who knows a lot about lactation, probably an IBCLC, but um, you know, I, I, as long as they've got the skills they need to be able to you know, lead a team of people who would, it would be their job to go in and support people with infant nutrition whether that's responsive paste bottle feeding or maintaining breastfeeding or finding them pumps and all of that stuff um, and that those those clinical team members would be um, alongside the medical team but you're absolutely right I think we also need to have you know across the board mandatory um, training for all healthcare staff who are you know patient facing um you know they, they all need to know you know who to call if there's a problem what website to to you know point people towards how to get a flipping breast pump if we need one so that we're not you know getting ridiculous situations that parents tell me about where you know they had to get a friend to call the switchboard of the hospital and then the switchboard goes oh i don't know um oh i don't know uh, let me ring a midwife and then they ring the the obstetric unit and they're like oh no sorry the infant feeding leads off at the moment and or i mean i I'm, I'm supporting a number of parents at the moment who are nursing extremely sick children sick children with cancer and all sorts of things um and if they need support with feeding I have this crazy situation where I have to ring the um, the infant feeding coordinator for maternity and say, look, I know you have no jurisdiction over paediatrics. I know it's a different budget. I know that your hours are ring fenced within maternity or within neonates because there's often a neonatal infant feeding lead as well. I had a crazy situation last week where I rung both the neonatal infant feeding lead and the maternity infant feeding lead, but neither of them had time to go and support this parent of a child with cancer because they were in pediatrics and they fell between these two services that's got to stop it's ridiculous we need a pediatric infant feeding lead so that we don't have to beg and borrow and steal breast pumps and we don't have a situation where people are saying oh i'm really sorry all the breast pumps are busy or oh i've got a child in the emergency department who's septic 
and this parent is breastfeeding and she hasn't fed her baby for six hours because her kid is septic and they're, you know, yeah. they're sleeping and they won't wake up because they're really ill. We need to get a breast pump. Come on, people. And then there's no breast pump available and nobody knows how it works because they're not taught that in the emergency department. It's so ridiculous, Tracy. Honestly, I, I could and I will write books about how ridiculous all of this stuff is, but it's happening every single day. And I think what you highlight that I, I think is so important for families to know, and what I, I like what you're saying is that I feel like if I went into that situation, I'd just be angry at everyone around me. And I'd feel like they were failing me. But it sounds like it's, no, they may be trying their best. They may be doing yeah. everything. You may have nurses that are behind the scenes doing all they can, but the system is failing yeah. everyone there. So it's not Absolutely. a, it's not really a lack of caring. It's a lack of knowledge about no, and, absolutely. And, and structure to go yeah, towards it absolutely and uh, one of the things that comes out a lot both in in my research and um in the the research that um i've trawled through um <laughs> is a lot of people are saying the staff was so lovely they were so kind they just didn't know they just didn't know how to help me they didn't know who to ring they didn't know that you know they, they just had no resources and not only that they were stretched they were overworked they were running around they were trying their best under extremely difficult situations and circumstances but it just wasn't helpful right that yes they saved my child's life but I really needed a breast pump or I had a blocked duct and I didn't feel like I could bother them with my block duck because they were busy saving my child's life. So how can I whinge about having, oh dear, it's um, it's that kind of stuff. So you're right, it's not a lack of compassion across the board. I think there are pockets of lack of compassion, actually. There are people who tell me horrible things. Um, and I've been told some pretty stupid things, you know, through my own experience of, of nursing through critical illness as well. But most of the time, people are really kind. They just are under-resourced and under-equipped. And if you don't have that knowledge yourself as to what you need and how to do it, I could see you just, you're in an overwhelming situation. You don't have it. So that's one of the pieces I actually want to get you to speak to. For anyone listening who has this, you talk about, I, I am quoting you here, the misinformation about plausibility and sustainability that it run rampants in pediatrics. What are the things that parents need to know? What, what, are the, what is the misinformation that parents are told so that if you do find yourself in this situation, you will be able to identify, hey, wait a second, I know that's not true. And I know because Lindsay said so, and we trust her more than we trust you. Um, is that, what do parents need to know? What are the things? Because you can go into that situation with your wealth of knowledge. You know, I feel like even myself, I don't have the same wealth of knowledge of, of the pediatrics and everything that you have, but I know in terms of nursing, someone says it's not sustainable. They might say something. I can go, yeah, I don't really buy that. Uh, and I have people I could call and trust, including you, to be like, hey, is this right? Uh, but not many people have that. They go in and they're told something. And when it comes from a doctor or a nurse, you tend to believe it. You take it as this is this is truth. This is gospel. And is that, so what are the things they need to be aware of? What are the statements that are being made that, should be red flags that if you hear it, step back and be like, okay, this is not necessarily the truth. Yeah, where do we start? So there, there are so many things that are said, like our oh, breastfeeding is harder work for babies. So if babies are sick, breastfeeding is harder work, or if they're feeding for a really long time, they're going to get tired. So those are the some of the things that, that we hear. And some of those are the most crazy things that I hear because we wouldn't think twice about giving a baby a pacifier, for example. Now, if a baby is suckling on a pacifier for what the whole day, nobody yeah. would go, oh my goodness, that baby's gonna get tired sucking on a pacifier. Um, and yet if they're comfort feeding, people start saying that baby's gonna get tired. Now, there's a piece here about, well, we need to know the baby is actually feeding because what's not great is if they are just going Num, 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 all day long and they're not actually getting intake because if they're sick they need fluid yeah but actually telling people silly things like oh no the baby should only be feeding for 20 minutes otherwise they'll get tired that's a red flag so that 
it's kind of helpful when people do that in a twisted way because that tells you that they don't know anything about lactation so <laughs> at that point you can say okay is it possible that i could have some feeding support to help me figure out whether my little one is managing to still effectively breastfeed through their pneumonia or through their you know whatever it is that they've got um yeah. And also, I think we we often assume that babies can't breastfeed. Now, sometimes they can't. Sometimes they are too poorly. Sometimes they do need to just have an NG tube and just just rest and not have to go to any effort. They can stay in skin to skin, maybe, or, or we can still keep them nearby or we can do lots of other supportive interventions. But maybe they can't actually sustain suck swallow breathe right now because that's actually a pretty big deal for most babies but what can we do i think sometimes we assume they can't breastfeed um and we go okay well let's just pump um but let's just let's just see about that actually could they breastfeed a little bit could they maybe have a try and somebody can be here and somebody can observe their breathing while they attempt a breastfeed and maybe could we check intake could we do some really, really compassionate test weights to see how much bit milk that baby's actually managed to transfer? And, you know, maybe if that baby needs more milk, well, could they start on the breast and then have the rest down the tube? Or could they could they even have their tube feed while just having some comfort suckling at the breast? You know, there are so many ways that we can make it kind of work um, mm -hmm. if we're willing to be flexible. And I think you know, the, the issue is whether people have got time to do that. It's often easier to just do a gravity NG feed than observe a full breast feed and then know that you might have to do an NG feed afterwards anyway. But, you know, how could we make this? How could we make it work? How can we show this parent that breastfeeding is important and it's valued and we're not being dismissive of it? It's just that it has to work in parallel with nursing care and critical care and medical care, um, it's not just put on a back burner yeah. because it won't wait, will it? If you if you just shelve breastfeeding and then return to it in a week's time, you know, it, it can be really difficult or it, sometimes it's impossible. So let's see if we can find a way to, to make it work in parallel. Um, in terms of the other things that are red flags, I mean, I, I think anytime people start talking about timed feeds, um, you know, scheduled feeds. Often this is for um, convenience reasons. It's not necessarily about clinical care. Um, if people are monitoring input and they're monitoring output and they're checking the baby's weight and the baby is monitored and there are other ways that we can assess hydration, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily need to be saying things like, no, that baby only can feed every four hours or every three hours. We we don't need to do that. It's it's archaic. Uh, there's no evidence that that is more helpful for all babies. Uh, there may be some nuanced circumstances where that is important, but in the main, it, it's really not something that we need to to do to to families. It's it's very very stressful for them. Mm -hmm. um, what else? There's so much. Um, I, with anesthesia, because that's one that comes up. I know, like, I've heard so many different things. My daughter went under once for, she had an abscess, but, you know, it was like, no, 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 it's a liquid, so you can't have it, you know, whatever, four hours before something like that. And then other people are told different times. Like, what is, if you do have a child going in for surgery or any procedure that requires anesthesia, what is the, the real information about nursing? prior to that like we know no food or drink all that stuff where does nursing fit in because it's not just any old food or drink right yeah it, it's really difficult because it's not counted as a clear fluid um yeah. so clear fluid technically is anything you can see through so you're allowed clear fluids normally the guidelines say two hours before uh, so for clear fluid so water or very very weak cordial which is practically pointless anyway because it doesn't taste of anything and if it's if it's if it's so thin that you can see through it you might as well just have the water anyhow oh, oh you've gone quiet Lindsay um, can you, hello. Oh, there you are. sorry it's you okay. went oh, yeah somebody was calling me um uh -huh. and they they're clearly not watching this so <laughs> they, they don't have <laughs> <Why not? laughs> 
<laughs> or they're kind of jumping in. I've got a question now. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, sorry. So you were saying it's not a so clear fluid. It's but... not clear fluid. But on the other hand, the gastric emptying time of, of breast milk is, is very, very quick. So you're right. Lots of people do talk about four hours. That's pretty that's pretty mainstream. Um, and most of the time, those are the gut. But these are some of the nuances that need to be worked out and, and need to be made consistent across all units so that nobody is confused about fasting mm -hmm. times. Uh, and and there, are, there are other scenarios that come up. For example, you know, you can't have, um, you know, milk after certain medications or whatever. But, you know, sometimes that's related to cow's milk, for example. Now, how does human milk fit into that? You know, mm -hmm. Is that different? Is it the same? You know, we need to figure that out as well. Um, and then sometimes people say, oh, just have sips of water and plain toast after you come round from anesthesia. Um, and, you know, maybe you don't want milk because that's really heavy. But mm, does that really apply to breast milk when you've got a post-op little one? I don't think so. Um, certainly, anecdotally, lots of little ones, the only thing they will tolerate when they're in pain and a bit nauseous and a bit, you know, uh, post general anesthetic the only thing they want to do is nurse to be honest and that makes so sense. i think there are lots of these little nuances mm -hmm. that that we actually need to iron out and lots of people um lots of people are thinking about it there's there's great work with people like the lactation pharmacist and with wendy jones mm -hmm. the breastfeeding network uh, with lots of pediatricians who are, are working uh, we've got in the uk we've got the hospital infant feeding network lots of great organizations are working really hard um, to, to try and get a little bit of clarity and a bit more consistent understanding about some of these rules and things that may or may not be evidence-based. Yeah. I love what you brought up earlier about the your ideal of the, the infant feeding team in PDA. It feels like that's necessary because when you talk about, you know, all this stuff, I all I hear is people saying they are busy trying to save your child's life and we want to add more to what they have to do and it can feel like for already overworked, like, shouldn't they just focus on what they do, but then have no when to kind of pass it off to someone else um, and have that where it seems like, you know, that might make it a bit more feasible as opposed to saying, no, you guys need to also be aware and responsible and everything. Because it does feel like it's just, I remember seeing the nurses when we were in, just they're running one place to the next. There's no... And I can only imagine it's even worse in a in a pediatric unit. We were in emergency, like in a pediatric unit, anything goes wrong. You're running off and they're babies and kids. So it's that weight feels even stronger. Um, but it's it is an interesting piece that it's like, yeah, I can hear all the people like I see why nursing can be dismissed easily because it's not saving the child's life. That's not, you know, and it's that whole, you know, we shouldn't care about stuff if it's not the most important in the moment, but yet we have to because it is so important in other ways as well. One of the things you brought up in the paper too that I want to talk about, and I feel like COVID makes it even more aware, is when you're nursing another child and you're in with a sick child, is that it's not necessarily just the breastfeeding relationship of the child who's in hospital, but other children as well and maintaining that. And I, the reason I bring up C word um, is that I know most hospitals now have different policies as to who can be in and it makes it even harder trying to navigate the care of other littles who may need that support. And especially if they're really little, if you think about an older child who might be in, they may not be nursing, but if you have a baby at home and you can't bring your baby in, you're now missing that distance. I mean, that that's a type of trauma for a young child to be separated from their caregivers. So what kind of supports can be in place for that situation and those people who may find themselves navigating that reality? Well, I think COVID <coughs> is a curveball, and I think all units are kind of handling that in slightly different ways. But, but yeah, there, there are two different, well, probably more than two scenarios, but the two most common scenarios are either we are... Um, the, the patient is an older child who is not breast or chest feeding. Let's say they're five. Like, let's say that they're in with an acute exacerbation of asthma. They need to be on hourly nebulizers. 
it's going to be a disaster for three days, but they're ultimately going to go home. But actually, what happens if we've also got a six week old baby in the mix who's breastfed? Now, normally um, one parent stays with one child, um, which means usually when you've got a, a situation where you've got two kids or more kids, there's the assumption that the other parent will stay home with um, the, the other children or child. There's loads of assumptions in that. We're assuming that there are two parents. We are assuming that both parents can take time off work, right? We're assuming that the other parent can just stay at home, drop everything. <laughs> and the other parent has dropped everything to be in hospital with, with the other child. So that's a massive assumption, two massive assumptions. We're also assuming that the, um, the, 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 the baby um, can just be fed in another way. Um, like it doesn't matter just well it's fine just express and you know your partner can just pick up the milk what have you have you ever been resident on a pediatric ward seriously seriously that there's no time to be messing around doing that kind of stuff you you it's too stressful there are too many things to do you might have your child going up and down to radiology for x-rays for physio for tests um all sorts of stuff and you're just trying to survive an incredibly profoundly abnormal experience of parenting in a goldfish bowl with people coming in you know every 45 minutes the cleaner comes in to change the bin uh, the doctors come in to do their round the nurses come in to check obs and change ivs and make the bed and then your child vomits everywhere and blah 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 it's chaos it's absolute chaos so we're assuming that inside of all of that chaos the parent has time and headspace and wherewithal to be able to express and find a way of getting that milk down to the waiting car. Or we're assuming that, that the nursing parent is actually staying at home and the non-nursing parent is in with the non-nursing child. That would be another way of playing it, right? Except that actually, if the child in question, the, parent, the patient is really poorly and unwell, Maybe they want their mummy. Maybe, maybe that's the person they need right now. And actually, as the as the, the parent, you, you often want to be with your little one when they're ill. So we get this situation where a parent feels really torn. So the obvious answer is for the baby to come in at the same time. And there are lots of objections to this when when that might be the logical solution. But the objections range from, well, that means you're exposing a sick baby to all of the bugs on the ward. Well, frankly, you know, they are exposed to the older child's sick bugs anyway. Mm -hmm. And if they're being breastfed in situ, then the antibodies that maternal milk contains is going to protect the little one to some extent anyway. So that's not really an issue. The other issue can be, well, you need to be able to be alert and, and sort of able to look after both children at once, because what's not going to happen is if you're fully responsible for the baby and they're needing a lot of your time, the nurses can't be expected to sort of, you know, come in and fully care for the older child. So that's sometimes an objection as well, because they're busy and they've got lots of stuff to do. And then the... the I just asked yeah. something on that. Sorry to interrupt you. I know. But I'm sorry. <laughs> Have they met parents that have two kids or more? Because is that just not what you do on a daily basis? I'm, or am I doing it all wrong? Am I like, <laughs> have I'm I been doing it wrong all these years? Like, you. No, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I suppose the final objection is where does everybody sleep? You know, we've got usually quite confined spaces um, that's to do with the structures and systems, right? And that we're not actually set up for family-centered care on, you know, in the pediatric ward environment or any environment, actually, even in neonatal intensive care units. Um, there are some countries that are getting this right. So if you look at a lot of the Scandinavian countries, for example, in their NICUs, they are set up for family-centered care. They have a double bed with a co-bedding crib. The main, there's the assumption that both the parents will stay if they want to. They don't have to, but they, they can. There's that facility. Whereas in practice, in a very small room that's maybe, you know, 12 foot 
um, by 12 foot or, you know, about three meters by three meters. That's a very small space. And they reasonably say that we've got to be able to access the emergency equipment. So the oxygen and suction, we've got to be able to lower the bed in case of, you know, cardiac or respiratory arrest. And we've got to be able to get equipment in. And if the room is full of beds and, you know, strollers and stuff everywhere, then that can get a little chaotic. But do you know what? I, I just think that there are there are ways of getting around this. And I've seen it work. I've, I've seen people make this happen. And that's what I meant about pockets of excellence, because I do I do see some people really working hard to protect this. But I think if the if the systems and structures were in place, they wouldn't have to work that hard to make it happen because it would just be expected normal, usual care. So if it was just expected that actually we provide a bed for the parent and if there is a, a, a bed sharing breast sleeping, you know, baby in the mix, the baby can go in with the parent um, and the other child, you know, we can get a, another bed for them or we can get a bigger bed or, or whatever. There are ways around it. Um, but I do, you know, it, it's going to take a massive shift in you know how we how we see the importance of some of this stuff but it would it would massively change the quality of life particularly for some of our longer stay patients who may be in hospital for you know months um months and months of of care and it, it's it's kind of family destroying to be separated like that yeah you know i just want to remind people too that i know i always hear the like other voices coming in of people being like, well, you know, she can say you can get around it, but can they really? You've been there. You're a pediatric nurse. So if anyone knows how to get around it, like you're not just speaking as someone looking at it going, well, I think I could get around it, but have no basis for this. Like you actually can look at a room and be like, no, we really can make this work. Um, which I think is so important to remember that you have this experience that many, when we talk about researchers, sometimes we research things that we don't have that firsthand experience with, but you have it because you were you are a nurse for 20 years you've been doing this in pediatrics. So it's clearly coming from someone with that expertise to be able to speak to it to that level. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I hope so. Yeah. And and also I've I've seen it, I've seen beautiful examples of care um, from from my colleague and even even my own so i mean if anyone doesn't know i, I breastfed my own child through cancer for uh, just over two years um, and some of the amazing examples of family-centered care that, that we encountered were things like nurses um, who set alarms on their phones for when our iv pump was about to run out so that i wasn't woken up by the bleeping of the iv pump for example i i would sometimes be vaguely aware of this little very very quiet presence ready to press that button on the machine and run the flush so that I could sleep um, you know other nurses who would say look tonight I know she's on a lot of fluid she's going to be you know peeing for England so let's just put her in a a, a pull up and I, I will come by every two hours and I will change her pull up so you don't have to get up and put her on the bedpan and weigh the urine and all of that rubbish that you have to do when you have a child with cancer and all of that, that happened, you know, that they, they gave us an entire bay one time um, so that all of us could be in the same bay um, to wake up on Christmas morning because we were in hospital um, on, on Christmas morning. They, they, they let my other daughter stay. They let my husband stay. We all stayed. We took over the whole room um, Clearly, if the ward had been full, that wouldn't have happened in that way. Mm. But I'm absolutely convinced, based on some of their behaviour, that they would have made it work. They would have found us extra beds and pull out chairs. We would have, we would have, you know, had two people in a single bed. They wouldn't have cared. It yeah. can, it can work, really. Yeah, that is. So in terms of, I mean, we talked about the misconceptions for families, what are the little things like you've had this, your experience, the research, those are great examples, but what can nurses and doctors do like that to support nursing families? Well, before we get to the systemic, obviously they need the systemic change, but there are these small moments that can mean a lot. 
So what yeah. are these things? Like, I feel like if they know it and they hear it, yeah. that's a, it gives them the tools, the ideas that they may not Absolutely. think of. So there are some really simple things that people could do. The first thing is when the child first comes onto the, the ward, the unit, the department, whatever you want to call it, um, they can take a really good feeding history so they can find out what is your child's usual milk? How do they normally um, feed? Tell me everything. So even, even if they're two, let's not assume that they've moved on from breastfeeding now because they're a big boy or a big girl. Yeah. Let's find out what are these child, what are their favorite foods and fluids? Yeah. Let's find that out. What brings your child comfort when they're sad? What do they like from you? Now, I was taught this 20 years ago. I was taught on admission, we find out like if your child is in pain, how do they show you that they're in pain? If your child is sad, how do they show you they're sad? And I think, unfortunately, in some of the busyness that's gone, but it actually doesn't take very long to say, is this normal for your little one? Do they normally get sad like this if, you know, they're six weeks old, but, you know, you're the expert on this little one. Is this normal behavior for them? What would normally, um, you know, make them calm down if, if you found that they were having, you know, this sort of little meltdown at home? What would you do normally? Okay, you would nurse them. Okay, well, why don't we try that? Let's see if that works. Um, you know, just, just taking a better history. Um, what do they normally eat and drink? Um, what brings them comfort? And then the other thing is, is there anything that you need me to do to make this easier for you? Is there is there something that would make nursing your child um, easier right now? <clears throat> so do you do you need a pump? Do you, do you need to know where you can put your pumped milk? So would you like me to show you the fridge? Would you like me to um, find you um, an extra curtain? Would you would you need a screen? It's like a goldfish bowl in here with everybody looking. And yes, you're absolutely within your rights to breastfeed wherever the heck you like. But actually, do you know what? Sometimes you don't want to have your boobs out in the middle of the open ward with everybody, you know, watching and getting a free for all. <laughs> you know, what What would help you? What, what would make your life easier right now? I can't make this go away. I can't wave a magic wand and let you go home. I can't stop the fact that your child's got to have IVs or has got to be nil by mouth for four hours. Like Those are things that we can't work around. What are the things that we can work around? Um, and it you know, we don't need to we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. It's really simple stuff that makes a big difference to families. Even just knowing that somebody knows that they're breastfeeding and that that's important to them and, and to know that that's valued is really, really helpful. That is it's so crucial because I it's true. I don't think I've ever been asked when going into that for just smaller things, but no one's ever asked if I'm breastfeeding or not. Sometimes it's come up and sometimes I get wonderful answers of, oh, that's so good. That's going to help a lot. That's great. So just keep doing that. Um, but it's not, you know, it, it comes up out of me either ending up nursing while we're waiting for something or, yeah. you know, something else that pops up. Um, but it's not ever been asked. It's not a, an, an issue yeah. that comes up there, which is fascinating. So in terms of just because I know we're coming up on our hour here and I thank you, I could I want to hear more. This is fascinating. I'm just going to have to have you back. When you have your systematic review out, then we'll just go over that paper. Um, all 11 studies. Um, but for families that are struggling with this and have this, what are their resources that are good? I mean, I know you mentioned your Facebook group that I don't know if people can ask to join or if it's something else if they're going through it. But where are places they can go to get support information if they find themselves in a situation like this um, and they're hearing stuff sometimes you know luckily with phones technology is not always great but when you're sitting in hospital and you're hearing stuff and you don't know what to do where can they go in those moments so both the acute moments of looking up something to find out but also for more support more generally um, as they go through this. Yeah, that's a that's a nice short question. So, um, <laughs> so do you have an hour? And we just <laughs> uh, so yes, they they are absolutely welcome to come and join the breastfeeding the brave group. That's um, it is a private group, um, so you do have to request to join, and that's just to protect the people in the group. That's all. Um, but you're very very welcome to do that. Um, you can join as a professional as well. I do just 
stress that you know it is primarily a support group it's not a group that you can go and learn from you know people who are going through really really horrible things um it is primarily there for the parents um so that's there there's also i've i've blogged um on feed sleep bond there's a um a blog fairly recently i can't remember exactly when it was maybe september i don't know august it was this year um and it's a huge list of resources so there's re resources about um pumping tube feeding um there's various clinical protocols uh, at the moment everything is spread out which is one of the things that i'm working on i want to bring everything together into something that's quite small and concise um, at the moment it isn't there so you can go to the uh, the academy of breastfeeding medicine there are lots of clinical protocols on there there's the lactation pharmacist um, there's kelly mom um, you can ask your ibclc they may or may not have experience working with little ones um, who are mm -hmm. unwell but they can certainly support you to maintain lactation. Um, so yes, there are. Sorry, I'm trying to time the stopping so that you finished coughing when when I. <laughs> sorry, I've got. A, I don't know what. <coughs> Pardon me. No, sorry. No, okay. it's fine. I I've been just talking and talking. I need a drink of water because I've got a dry mouth as well. But um, there are there are some resources out there. Um, feel free to read. I mean, I say with slight trepidation feel free to reach out, but um, <laughs> maybe not all at the same time. Yeah, it's well, this goes to your lack of work-life balance is yes. you'll just add more to it. But yeah. it seems like, so I guess I want to highlight the Feed Sleep Bond has a list of resources yes, if people it does. find that piece. And you can find it on your phone if you find yourself in, in that moment. Um, you can find that there. And I think that's obviously, yeah, getting this all concise and into it almost needs like a pamphlet that you arrive and it's in the hospital and here is your little, I mean, I know it's yeah. not going to be anything that fits in a pamphlet, but a book, a little, you know, mini ride that's there yeah. for families to just pick up. So that's your next project now that you can do that and we'll just put it everywhere. That's right. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a blog. I also blogged a, a few years ago now um, uh, about, you know, how to survive a hospital admission with your breastfed baby. And that, it's actually relevant whether you are going into hospital, like with, I don't know, appendicitis or whatever, or your little one is going yeah. into hospital. And it's just got just the things that you are likely to forget, like your phone charger, like, you know, <laughs> maternity pads, if it's a, if this is a brand new baby, um, mm -hmm. like snacks, because the food's, you know, provided for nursing parents, but it's not brilliant. Um, yeah. Things like that. So, I mean, there's, there's that blog as well. That's kind of like a, a quick one to read and even if you do just drop everything get in the car and go to the ed you can send a partner or a friend or a someone that blog and go ah these are all the things that i forgot quick go go and collect all of this stuff and bring it to me yeah. to to save me for the next two days or whatever it is honestly like we need another talk on hospital food why how why this long that's question for another day but I don't another get it day. another, another day. day it would it would help if sick kids got amazing food and nutrition wouldn't it well, and, and parents too that are in there and and you know it would be nice to eat things that again, look edible it is patchy there are some hospitals that are doing better at this um again you know uh, I've, I've had some actually really good food um in some places others not yeah. so much well, I'll, exactly. I'll live on my packet of raisins and nuts <laughs> thanks Exactly. That's all right. Well, I just oh, well. I can't thank you enough. This has been so enlightening and so wonderful. And I mean, I'm seeing the comments pop up of how many people are just thank you so much for this today. Um, it is this has been eye opening, um, just like reading the paper was if you can get access to the paper. I know you had to send it to me because I don't think it's publicly it's available, but yeah, it, the next yeah. one will be though. So the the SR okay. will be open access. So that will yeah. be that'll be really easy. Um, okay. I probably I don't know if I can even say which journal it's going to be, and I don't know if I'm allowed. But anyway, it, it will be open access. Just, um, be open access. just I'll I'll put it up, and you can share it, and I'll share yeah. it. And yeah, it'll be fine. But if you are in the field, I strongly suggest reading this paper, the call to action, because it can, you can take these concrete little recommendations and try to implement them where you are. And that's what I love about it. it. It is such, and it's in clinical lactation. That's the journal. 
it, you know, it's 2020, it came out. So it's available. If you can get access to it, you really should. All doctors, nurses, anyone working with families in pediatrics, really, this should be a must read for everyone. And I hope that it does become so because it's so needed. So Lindsay, thank you so much. This You're is so welcome. Uh, thank you. Always brilliant discussion. And I love this work and I can't wait to see more of what you're doing with it. It's, thank you. Um, yeah, thank it's you. great. So thank you. Um, thank you all for listening now and later and live and not. Um, like I said, this will be up and Feed Sleep Bond. You're on Instagram, all these other places. Where do people find you for all this work? It is. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram. I'm at Lindsay underscore Hookway. Um, uh, you can find updates about my research on lindsayhookway.com. And yeah, I'm Feed Sleep Bond here on Facebook. Um, <laughs> Yeah, You're just changing I'm, names all over the just, place. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to trying to get the word out. And if you are in the UK and you haven't yet done my health professional survey, will you please do it? That would be amazing. It's um, it, it did the rounds on Twitter. I'm going to shove it up again on Twitter um, again today. I'll share it with you if you want. Thank I'll you. put it out and stuff. Just send it to me and we'll get it out. But um, yeah, it is. Lovely as always. And thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday um, in, I know it's all been, as we were discussing all different, but um, yeah, it's uh, hopefully 2021. It's just a little bit. It's going to be the year. It's going to be the yeah, year. It, it'll it be great. Be. Yeah. <laughs> it better, right? <laughs>